So it's, it's my pleasure to welcome everybody to um, VAMS Connections. Um, and just to give you a little bit idea about VAMS Connections, uh, uh, like it was pointed out before, that this is a series of programs that we started last year. Um, and, and, and the idea is that because Vancouver Indian Heritage Month Society uh, does spend quite a bit of effort for, uh, and, and the programs kind of are organized for the month of May, that we want to remain um, in contact and connected with our members throughout the year. And so we started this, this, uh, this program. And uh, again, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, uh, our uh, on-site meetings have been uh, suspended. So, but we try to continue uh, virtually, and so we are continuing with that. So, um, so that is VAMS Connections, and um, I'm um, I'm very uh, pleased to uh, bring this VAMS Connections event uh, of 2021 uh, to you today. And uh, this is a, as part of our special AGM event, and um, and and this this special event features a, a very special guest today, and I'll introduce him to you in, in a minute. Um, so welcome everybody to uh, this uh, uh, first uh, 2021 um, Rams Connections uh, event, uh, and especially this year of the 25th uh, anniversary of Rams, uh, Golden, uh, sorry, Silver Jubilee year. Uh, so we are very excited to, uh, to 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 bring more programs, and especially uh, to um, the, through this uh, series of programs uh, over the year. Um, my name is Shahid Abrar al Hassan, and I'm uh, VAMS director, and also, I'm also the chair of uh, VAMS Connections. And um, so I'm very pleased to, to welcome our guest tonight, uh, who I will introduce to you uh, in, a, in a moment. So today's, today's uh, event is uh, entitled The Asian Heritage Saga uh, in the Lower Mainland. And I'm delighted to introduce to you our uh, guest uh, tonight, Professor Jan, Jan Walls. And he is a professor emeritus in the humanities department at Simon Fraser University, uh, where he was founding director of the David Land Center for Intercultural Communication and undergraduate Asia uh, Canada program. In addition to teaching at Aichi University in Japan, the University of British Columbia, the University of Victoria and Simon Fraser University, he also served as first secretary for cultural and scientific affairs uh, at the Canadian embassy in Beijing uh, in, uh, from 1981 to 83. And then a senior vice president of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada from 1985 to 87. Um, he has published extensively uh, many translations of um, traditional Chinese poetry and prose. Uh, he is currently a director of the Canadian Society for Asian Arts and serves as honorary advisor to the Chinese Canadian Writers Association, the Chinese Canadian Artist Federation of Vancouver, the Golden Panda International Film Festival, uh, the International Arts Gallery, and uh, several other nonprofit cultural organizations. He has been a trustee on the board of the Dr. Sanya Sen Classical Chinese Garden Society, a director on the board of uh, Success, co-president of the Vancouver Asian Heritage Month Society, and a member of the government of British Columbia's Multicultural Advisory Council. In 1992, he was awarded the Confederation Medal and in 2012, the Queen's uh, Diamond Jubilee Medal, uh, which honors Canadians who have made uh, a significant contribution to their fellow citizens, to their communities, and to Canada. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's welcome Professor Jan Walls. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Walls, for, for being here with us today. And uh, we are very delighted to have you here um, and, uh, and have this conversation. So this, this program is going to be like a conversation. Uh, there'll be a few questions I'll be asking you and, uh, and then uh, we will open the floor to our audience and uh, so that they can directly ask you questions. Um, so just, uh, just a second. Um, okay, so I hope uh, you can hear me clearly. I can hear you clearly. Thank you okay. very much. Okay, at my, my pleasure. Age, at my age, it's an honor to, to be anywhere. 
especially <laughs> here today. Yeah, no, I uh, looking at your uh, contribution and achievements over over the decades. It's uh, it's, it's was very hard to summarize that in a, a short paragraph, and uh, so we will ask you uh, about that uh, in in this conversation, which is going to be about uh, forty to fifty minutes uh, sure. all, all together. And um, so, uh, j just to get started, I want to just uh, mention that you very kindly sent a koi bar presentation uh, video, right? So which somehow did not play very well. So we will not be playing that video, but I'll, I'll be playing the, the one which is on YouTube. So I hope you don't mind that. No problem. Sure. So um, talking about your work, uh, uh, Jan, that uh, you, know, you have done so much work in so many different areas uh, uh, related to Asian heritage uh, in, in the lower man and, and then of course in the, in the wider context in, in China. Um, mm -hmm. So could you, could you please tell us a little bit about your work uh, that, uh, you know, that you have done over the years? Um, um, you, have, you have written books, you have uh, researched, you have taught, you have uh, performed. So, so you would like, so it'd be great if you can have uh, some more details of your work. Hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> my first job was to, uh, to make myself understood when the family made a major move from South Carolina, which is where I was born and spent my first eight years, where well, everybody talked like this. <laughs> I thought this was the way everybody talked. So uh, my first eight years, I talked like this all the time. <laughs> when I was eight years old, uh, the family moved from South Carolina back to Indiana which is where they came from. Both my mama and my daddy both came from Indiana. And I was the laughing stock of Christian Park Elementary School number 82, because I talked like this. <laughs> and, and, and they all talked through their nose and what's called a Hoosier twang. So it took me about three weeks to switch from a Southern drawl to a Hoosier twang talking through my nose <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's how I first learned uh, the importance of uh, being able to communicate naturally and effectively with your environment um, but uh, knowing the difference between uh, who you are personally where you came from and uh, who you are personally, where you came from, and being able to adapt to wherever you are. So I, I think that's a, I think that's a situation in which many uh, Canadians with an Asian heritage uh, can relate to. <laughs> and their challenge would meant for many of them the challenge is greater than mine uh, was because uh, I, I still looked like everybody else pretty much. People didn't look at me and think, oh, there's a foreigner, right? Um, <clears throat> so first of all, that got me interested in language. And then as a child, uh, my mother was a teacher, a school teacher, taught in, in I guess, elementary as well as high schools. Um, and my father was uh, a bookkeeper, I guess, in a, in, a, in a company setting. And all I knew was when, you know, when I was in high school, I didn't really know what I wanted to be when I grew up. All I knew was I didn't want to be a teacher like my mother, and I didn't want to be uh, uh, an office person like my father. <laughs> And guess what? I ended up being a teacher and uh, an administrator in a research center. <laughs> so, uh, you, you, you can't always achieve the personal goals that you set for yourself. I learned that very early. Um, I was uh, struck as a, as a student by, I, I've always been fond of poetry at all levels from the street to the, you know, to Shakespeare. Um, <clears throat> but one which always stuck in my mind, uh, well, two things which always stuck in my mind. One was 
um, Robbie Burns' famous lines, ah, would some power the gift to gee us to see ourselves as others see us. And then much later on, I, I learned in a field of study called symbolic interactionism. Um, there's a very powerful formula under which or through which all of us grow up. And that is, well, some of us grow up more maturely than others, but that formula influences all of us. And that is, this is how I see you seeing me. This is how I see you seeing me. We all grow into that vision of ourselves, which is given to us by those who care for us, take care of us when we're young, when we're infants. This is how I see you seeing me. Many infants are lucky enough to grow up uh, with an image of themselves, which they see in their parents or elder siblings' eyes as, aha, here is the next prime minister or whatever, or, or geez, this, this, this guy isn't going to be worth very much. He's not going to go very far. And this is how I see you seeing me. That affects the way we see ourselves. Um, and that has been uh, a pretty powerful influence on me when I get in, when I interact with people. Um, this is how I see you seeing me. And that, that is either within a monocultural environment or in a diverse cultural, a culture of diversity. This is how I see you seeing me. If I look at and other, someone who is quite different from myself okay. uh, in such a way that raises a consciousness of difference. Um, that's going to make it hard to relate as equals in, a, uh, in an ordinary, everyday conversation. Um, so I, uh, I, try, I, I, I try to live by remembering that this is how I see you seeing me and I don't want you to see me as seeing you as something too different from me or something lesser uh, than myself. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Uh, and especially how, uh, you know, these early experience, childhood experiences uh, got you interested um, in, in understanding what, what it's, it's like to be different uh, and uh, having multiple identities. And we'll talk about those identities in a, in a, in a moment. And mm -hmm. um, I, I particularly want to ask you, uh, Jan, about uh, uh, two uh, specific parts of your work. One mm -hmm. was uh, very exciting uh, that um, you founded David Lamb Center for Intercultural Communication, uh, yeah. which is- yeah. very much It's the David Lamb Center for International Communication. Uh, the the proposal that I submitted to Senate uh, at, at SFU uh, called it the David Lamb Center for Intercultural Communication. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, but that was objected to by the representative from uh, the Department of Anthropology because he said intercultural is an anthropology thing. If you want to uh, put your center and its um, uh, it's uh, it's uh, financial support under the Department of Anthropology. That's fine. I said, mm, no, we'll change it to international communication. And I crossed my fingers, hoping that political science wouldn't say international yeah. <laughs> political science. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, but, but, but that that is true. But but intercultural communication is essentially very interdisciplinary, so it's probably not owned by <laughs> or mm. kind of not. Uh, you know, overly dominated by any particular discipline, but of course, it has a lot of inter uh, interdisciplinary um, orientations. Right. So, yeah. Anyway, the uh, <clears throat> it, it passed as the Center for International Communication, oh, okay. and then uh, when the word got out that SFU was uh, creating a Center for International Communication at its new downtown campus uh, in Harbor Center. Um, Shortly, I got a phone call from uh, uh, David Lamb, um, suggesting that he would like to support. He would like to support that. All right. So that means he gives a million dollars to SFU. SFU, of course, uh, took one quarter of that for 
bricks and mortar, <laughs> so they had uh, three quarters of a million as an endowment, uh, the interest from which would uh, uh, would support the um, you know the day-to-day -day running <clears throat> of the center. And of course, I asked him, "May we name this center the David Lamb Center for?" international communication of course he said no 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 that's not necessary <laughs> by my understanding of uh, chinese culture i knew that if i didn't ask him again he would probably be a little disappointed because <laughs> you're supposed to refuse the first two times and reluctantly accept uh, the third time so i asked him again um, no that's not necessary and the third time well if you insist and so uh, we became named the David C. Chai Lam uh, Center for International Communication. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, so, you know, intercultural communication or international communication is a very buzzword, especially these days when, you know, there's so much, um, you know, influence of globalization and movement of people and ideas and knowledge and uh, is happening. Uh, and so, um, could you highlight some of the some of the services or some of the contribution this center has made with, in terms of educating people in intercultural communication, especially uh, the local community here in Vancouver? Sure. Um, wow. If I if I'd known you were going to ask this question, <laughs> I would have pulled out all of my annual reports <laughs> where we bragged about <laughs> we bragged about how many trainees uh, we produced in the past year. I, yeah. Uh, you know, it was in the the usually in the hundreds if you include um, uh, extended seminars and that sort of thing and workshops uh, on intercultural communication. Uh, or one of them that's still going on today is the um, intercultural forum uh, on a forum on intercultural management, uh, which was directed, of course, to the business community. Um, and <clears throat> what it looks for, what that forum looks for, we, we get pr prestigious speakers, some academic, some from the business community itself, um, to talk about the challenges, uh, the successes and setbacks of cross-cultural or intercultural collaboration in a business setting, okay? Um, and many of our students the, that we had, these are non-credit courses, which uh, you don't have to go through the university registrar Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, apply with your, uh, your transcripts and that sort of thing. These are for non-credit training programs for uh, people in the community. We, we trained, I think, over the years that I was there from, um, and, and we opened our doors in 1989, and I retired in 2006. So from 1989 to 2006, uh, we trained in, uh, we also, <laughs> the, some of this was for Asia, such as the forums, the, uh, the forums on cross-cultural management and so forth was covered the whole of Asia. Uh, some of them focused on China, some of them focused on Japan, some on South Asia, some on Southeast Asia, but altogether we, we trained, uh, I think a few thousand, oh, okay. a few thousand people in the lower mainland. Yeah, in okay. uh, that's great communication, both in, in general in society and for the business community. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that, <laughs> that, that I feel pretty good about that because at that time from yeah. the late eighties through the nineties and the early two thousands, I don't think anyone else was really doing that. Yeah. So that's, that's a remarkable achievement of this center and it's very much needed. Um, I mean, the reason I also asked you this question was because I also teach uh, intercultural communication. I have taught intercultural communication at universities here in Canada mm -hmm. and in China too. So mm -hmm. um, whenever I, uh, I, I teach this course or in any workshop, and I always see everybody uh, very positive about that, interested in this, this topic. And, but a lot, lot of times uh, intercultural communication is perceived as like, some basic tips, how to greet people, how to say thank you, kind of, you know, those basic things. Yeah. Um, whereas there's a lot of goes uh, in is manifested in communication ideologies and values and and and, and, and cultures, 
Um, so I think it's, it's very much needed and, uh, and, and very, uh, a lot of people actually will appreciate that if they, if they can learn and know people uh, <clears throat> through their cultures and, 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 and kind of re which reinforces their identities as well. Okay, that's fantastic. And moving on to this, another uh, aspect of your work. So of course you have been uh, involved uh, very uh, intensely over the years or decades uh, in academic research, uh, especially uh, on, on Chinese culture and language and, and, and uh, uh, especially uh, medieval literature. Um, so uh, would you like to share any, any highlights of uh, your research uh, uh, in, in these areas uh, uh, that you would like to share with our with audience? The most obvious, <clears throat> uh, first of all, let, let me, there's two little things I wanted to say before sure. we finish the last topic. Uh, one, uh, in communication in general, not just cross-cultural, but in, even within your own cultural community, your own language and cultural community, nonverbal communication. And by that, I mean things like we, in, in, the, in the field of research, we call oculesics. That is the way you use your eyes when you're communicating with the, directly with a person, whether looking as we grow up saying, you know, our parents tell us, look me in the eyes, you know, when you're talking, <laughs> if I look away, that's a sign of guilt or something. Whereas in, in many parts of Asia, for example, if you're looking a person directly in the eye when you're talking to them, that's, you know, the Chinese, there's a Chinese verb, ding, ding somebody, you're, you're, you're nailing them with your eyes, right? Uh, which is a sign of aggression. So it's quite proper to look away, right? Uh, but it's not proper, so proper to look away over here because yeah. it looks like you may be guilty, for example. Um, proxemics is another one, the distance that you yeah. keep. Do you keep a respectful distance or do you aim for uh, an intimate, dis a close uh, relationship? I'm sorry. Anyway, these, um, th these aspects of communication actually are more fundamental, more viscerally believable than anything you may say if you know the language, yeah. <laughs> you might use the language to offend somebody if you don't know about these nonverbal things. Okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. The, the second, that's a great point, yeah. The second question. Yeah, <laughs> uh, oh, oh, sure. No, I, 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 I'll repeat that. That um, uh, could, could you please uh, share some highlights of your research uh, over, the, you know, over the years? And uh, you have, I was looking at your work and so you have done a remarkable uh, research, uh, funded research on uh, Chinese language and culture and, uh, uh, and, and, and literature. So any, any of the highlights of that research I'd like to share? Uh, <laughs> wow, highlights. I, I usually, well, actually a highlight was, uh, you know, for the, the last few books uh, that, uh, that, that, that I've been involved in. And, and very often for the last many years, uh, I co-publish, co-research uh, with my wife because we've been okay. uh, colleagues ever since we were uh, graduate students in, in the classroom together at Indiana mm -hmm. University. And we've published a lot of what we've published, we've done as co-authors. Um, the most exciting things that have happened have been, um, uh, uh, we were approached by Cambridge University Press uh, to author, uh, co-author a book called Using Chinese, which is, and it's not Chinese people, it's using Chinese and is in the sense of the Chinese language. Because um, uh, the I hadn't been approached by a prestigious publisher before, uh, certainly not in this area. Primarily before that, um, it was mostly translations, uh, uh, literary translations. I did my bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees, all majoring in Chinese language and literature, minoring in Japanese language and literature, and Asian folklore, those three, the three areas, uh, Chinese, Japanese, and Asian folklore. Um, but that, that was one of the most pleasant surprises I've had. Uh, another one was we were uh, approached by a publisher in, uh, in China uh, to publish a bilingual uh, book on uh, on the, on the ways that 
China perceives North America and mm -hmm. North American communication and the way North Americans perceive China and Chinese wow. uh, communication. Uh, it, it basically a bilingual book, which you read it from one side. <laughs> uh, it's, it's written, actually, we, we wrote the, the English version for uh, native speakers of English to better understand uh, Asian, most, mostly Chinese uh, communication. And the Chinese version, we wrote it from the standpoint of someone who already understands uh, Chinese, but uh, is trying to understand North American English uh, speakers. Um, and we're very happy to have, <laughs> to have that published. We got some good feedback on that. Yeah, and most recently, oh, the one that we'll be doing a uh, a, a book uh, hey, promotion for um, uh, this spring uh, is um, we let's see. Well, yeah, we agreed to do this, and then after we submitted all of the the uh, this was to be a bilingual you know, face-to-face -face, uh, Ch uh, Chinese original with English translation of the poetry of Wang Anshi. Um, and we showed them our translations and the publishers were so uh, happy about it that they hired uh, an illustrator uh, to paint uh, mm -hmm. illustrations for each of the 130 poems uh, <laughs> that, we, that we translated. And uh, had, we've received some pretty good feedback. Uh, on that book. Okay, great. Thank you. And, um, you know, in addition to research, being a remarkable researcher and teacher and translator, uh, another important um, aspect of your uh, contribution or your, your, your profile is uh, the, the, the musical instrument of Koi Bar. Uh, I don't know if I pronounced it correctly. Uh, and uh, I know you have, uh, you have been performing that uh, uh, over, over the years and um... ever, since, ever since the early 1970s. <laughs> okay, <all right. laughs> so I will um, just to introduce to our audience. I'll play that uh, that video, uh, which uh, which is your video, which is uh, available on YouTube here, and then we will talk about uh, uh, this musical performance. Sure. I'm not sure I would dignify it by with the word musical, but please go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay just to give me a second, please. Okay, here we go. I hope the audio quality is okay. <laughs> Chow 一集这才急行了，哈哈哈，错了错了，真错了。拿着铁把拐棍把它当金桥。Big <笑> commotion late last night. Thinking about money, couldn't sleep tight, so I grabbed a spade and headed south. I found a spot way out of sight and I dug with all my might. Who would have guessed? I dug right into a treasure chest: coins of silver, coins of gold, diamonds, baskets full. Pearls and precious stones to boot. Now, where am I going to stash all this loot? Uh, it's too dangerous in the ground, not at buildings. They burn down. Lend it out, no one to trust. Start a business, it might bust. The more I thought, the more I got uptight. 
till I blew a fuse, woke up and saw the light. <laughs> wrong, wrong, how wrong could I be? Uh, my iron-handled walking stick is gold enough for me. Yeah. That was that was done as part of a longer interview, uh, which uh, was done at home <laughs> and it was in my house. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, that is, that is uh, more than a musical performance and uh, because it's not just uh, a plain instrument also representing a culture and especially the folk culture, uh, which is very deeply rooted in, uh, in, 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 in the history and in, 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 the, in the geography and, uh, and in, the, in, the, in that specific culture. So kind of, uh, I would ask you kind of, if you could just tell us a little bit more about this instrument, how did you learn, what, it, what does it represent? Sure. Let, let me give you a close up of <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> There are two of them, and they're basically two slabs of bamboo. In the right hand, oh, actually each of them has a hole punched in them, and through the holes, you can, you know, you can, you can use fancy tassels if you want, but basically just, most people just have a string, a string in between them and have them just far enough apart that so that when you hang them over your thumb, um, you can still, there's enough space left to manipulate because this, when you're telling a story, for example, this becomes one of your props, you know, it could be a, a toting pole when you're, if that's a part of the story you're telling, uh, it could be a weapon. Uh, anyway, it becomes a prop as well as uh, a, a percuss percussive instrument. And this is in your right hand and this creates uh, a slower, deeper sound. And you can also create a sound chamber with your hand because this is curved, right? Yeah. So you keep, you keep that going. And then you have, <clears throat> this is called the tabar, the big clappers. These are called the jiedza. <laughs> jiedza actually uh, means the joints. Uh, I don't call it that because joint means something different today than it did when <laughs> when these were first uh, invented because they're smaller pieces of bamboo. Uh, four of them <clears throat> facing uh, the fifth and the distance between again with holes uh, punched in each one of them. String passed through the holes just enough space between this one and the others to allow your index finger uh, to go through. And there are coins, the, mm -hmm. you know, the Chinese coin with a okay. hole in the middle, that's symbolic of round heaven and square earth, oh, heaven and wow. earth, so symbolic of the universe, right? Mm -hmm. um, and those are there so that these four don't hit each other at the same time. So rather than uh, doc, doc, you get drat, drat. And then you, you, you get your basic beat with this. And then this goes twice as fast. Okay. <laughs> all sorts of uh, funny stuff. Um, <laughs> but that, <clears throat> what I just did just now, that's yeah. called the Ding Chang Ban, settle the crowd clapper. Okay. okay. Uh, every, I think every performer knows the first print. First, you got yeah. to get their attention. <laughs> 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 so that settles the crowd. Yeah. Uh, and uh, okay, this <clears throat> comes from a long tradition of so what today would probably be called buskers, busking. But actually prior to busking even, busking is something that's done in a stationary place where you sort of draw a circle, <laughs> a yeah. circle around you and you hope that people will stop and listen to you and you, you, know, you put your hat down and hope they'll drop some coins in. The Chinese did that, but first they, 
they called themselves the people who did this going from house to house. They called mm -hmm. themselves uh, Mai Iren, uh, sellers of the arts, <laughs> okay. of performing arts. Mm -hmm. uh, they were, of course, uh, Chinese called Jiao Huazi. They were beggars, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but they would go from door to door uh, making this noise so that uh, people inside the, uh, the compound, or the, the housing compound, would know somebody was outside. And then they would, <clears throat> they, they had, it's a very interesting combination of uh, set pieces and opportunities to um, specify the new situation. So they had in mind, for example, <clears throat> Uh, the, the, this, this seller, seller of the arts, this uh, itinerant beggar, would come up and, and make, make his uh, thing outside, is mm -hmm. outside the door, and then the guy, the, one of the people in the house, would open the door, and maybe, maybe a, the, a dog, <laughs> a Pekingese dog, for example, would come charging out of the door and seeing a stranger, and he would start a dialogue with the dog. Tell shall go and in be y'all. Yeah, uh, listen, puppy, don't you bite. You tear my <laughs> poor old tattered coat. You can rip it in the summer. That's all right, but if you tear it in the winter, that's all she wrote. Yeah. <laughs> Stuff like that, and then you know the householder might come out and compliment him on his. Uh, on, on his ability to extemporize, uh, then he would get into a dialogue with, oh, please, my Lord, don't exaggerate. I chatter and babble and prattle and prate. Uh, but if my Lord has mercy on me, how about giving me a dollar eight? <laughs> Something like that. It, it always ends up with the same uh, request, right? Uh, then they went, when, you know, if people flattered them enough and told them they're really good often enough, they would rather than go from house to house, they would go to a bridge crossing, some place where there's a bridge, because if a bridge is needed to get across a stream or whatever, a lot of a lot more people are going to come by there. So they would make their circle in the sand and perform there and hope to, uh, you know, to have, if, if anybody stops and listens to them, they're expected to put something in the hat. And okay. they went from that to okay. the tea houses mm -hmm. uh, where they became regular entertainment, uh, where, by the way, these short pieces uh, evolved into epics, which would take an entire summer to complete. So oh. one episode every, oh, okay. every evening after work, one episode uh, for an entire summer. And coincidentally, on, in average, there are about 100 episodes uh, to most of the epics uh, in China. Okay, um, and uh, so, so how, how did you get interested in, in this art and especially reaching this level of mastery? Well, as I mentioned before, I, my, my bachelor's, master's, PhD degrees, I, main, made, I minored in Asian folklore. Okay. And so I've always been interested in Asian folklore, but uh, it wasn't until I started teaching Chinese at UBC in 1970 that I really learned about the challenges of keeping student interest up in <laughs> basic language teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, oh, by, yeah. by the end of the week, by Friday, uh, the students were starting to get bored with, uh, mm -hmm. what is this? This is a pen. What is that? That is a pencil, you know, and the, the <laughs> basic yeah. vocabulary of uh, yeah. Chinese in the first year or even second year. Uh, and so I started looking for ways to rekindle their enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, some of it was teaching them uh, folk songs, simple folk songs, so that they could actually perform, you know, sing in in Chinese, um, sometimes I would uh, teach them how to chant uh, classical poetry, uh, which is kind of a sub sublime thing. But then I discovered I discovered this uh, popular performing art. So I had one of my 
previous students who had graduated and uh, gone, actually took the, uh, uh, the um, foreign service exams and became a junior diplomat assigned to the embassy in Beijing. Uh, I wrote him a letter, airmail. <laughs> uh, there, was no, there was no email or anything like that back <laughs> in the 19, early 1970s. Um, I, I asked him if he could uh, go to the uh, store. There was a shop on Wang Fujing Boulevard in downtown Beijing, which uh, had uh, folk instruments. Uh, they could sell folk instruments. I asked him to buy me a set of these things. Uh, he did. He uh, mailed it to me. I got it. And then I got the, the first year we had any exchange students from China at UBC in the early 70s. Uh, I got an exchange student to show me how to hold them. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and then I got some recordings of oh, okay. record at that time, they, you know, the little 33 and a third uh, records, uh, recordings of performances. And so by listening to that, once somebody showed me how to hold them, then there's only one way to produce the sounds, right? They're just the big ones and the blue ones. <laughs> so I imitated those. Mm. Uh, until 1978. In 1978, that same student uh, was, uh, he was still in the embassy, working in the embassy. He invited me as a guest of the embassy uh, to come spend two weeks uh, in Beijing as his guest. And while I was there, uh, he arranged for me to have a meeting with uh, the, probably the premier performer of the Kwai Ban uh, in, in the Beijing popular performing arts uh, group and I had a meeting with him and he, of course he told me everything I was doing was wrong and he showed me <laughs> how, how to do it a little more authentically um, and then uh, in 1981 <clears throat> from 81 to 83 um, I, I was you know, at that time I switched uh, I was invited to teach at U UVic so I was teaching at UVic from 78 until 85 81 to 83 UVic seconded me to the foreign, uh, external affairs and so I was in the embassy as cultural counselor for uh, two years every weekend I would invite uh, Liang Homin uh, this, this the, the premier Kwai Ban performer I would invite him to our apartment for lunch and mm -hmm. as everyone knows there's no such thing as a free lunch. Mm -hmm. So he would give me lessons. Oh, okay. uh, and then every other week, um, every other weekend, I would invite a professor of uh, Chinese instrumental music uh, for lunch and uh, we'd have lunch, but he would, he would teach me the, the xiao, the, bamboo flute, the uh, uh, vertical, not the horizontal, but the vertical bamboo flute, um, and teach my wife, uh, Yvonne, um, the, the gu qin, the zither, the old Chinese zither. Um, I learned, learned a lot in those two years that way. <laughs> I just through that, through, through the principle, there's no such thing as a free lunch. <laughs> so that, that, is, that is very exciting that how, uh, you know, you're this uh, artistic apprenticeship, uh, you know, happened and <laughs> evolved yep. over. And I'm particularly intrigued by, you know, how you use this instrument for for um, musical instrument as a pedagogical tool. Uh, that is something very insightful for me as a teacher. So <laughs> it's a pedagogical tool. Back yeah. then, we, just, we we didn't have uh, computers and uh, okay. printers where I could print out and <laughs> uh, yeah. these things. That's right, uh, yeah. We had mimeographs. <laughs> we had oh, yeah. mimeographs <laughs> where, uh, you know, where you you'd type stuff into it and uh, and then roll, roll them out one by one very seriously, very slowly. Um, but what I would do is I would take every, anything from, uh, from a, a Tang poem, uh, the Tang Dynasty, a famous poem, which virtually every Chinese uh, learned in probably an elementary school um, and print it out with the Chinese characters, then with the pinyin pronunciation of under each character, and then a word by word, word for word translation right under that, and then uh, usually a, an anglicized version of what that really means. Um, yeah. That's how I first got into <laughs> okay. 
I first got into cross, what I now call cross-cultural translation. Okay. okay. Cross-cultural translation is translating not word for word, but translating in such a way that the English version produces a reaction in the English speaking listener, which is nearly identical to the reaction that the Chinese listener had when it was in Chinese. Oh, okay. Wow. So it's yeah. goal oriented uh, translation. Yeah, that's, that's brilliant. Um, I, I have a few more questions about, uh, uh, about folk music and its uh, relevance to our local cultural set, uh, landscape here in, in, in Vancouver. But I'll yep. uh, now I'll offer our participants any a, a chance to ask you any questions. Uh, so, um, so please feel free to ask uh, uh, Professor Walls any questions. Um, you can type your questions in the chat box, and uh, I'll pass them on to to him. Uh, Jasper, can you help with that? <clears throat> or maybe open open the mics. <clears throat> Is anyone still awake out there? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we have we have a uh, twenty two people there uh, listening to you. Um, so Jasper, are you there? Okay, um, I, I would I would ask our uh, our audience uh, if you if you have any questions, you, you please feel free to ask those questions. You can type your question in the chat box. Or well, Letitia, do you, if you have any question, we can start with. Well, I, I I I am always fascinated by by Jan. I mean, I I have the pleasure of. Uh, consider him one of my friends and uh, and and uh, I have admired his work and, and his life and what he does um, and uh, I think that a very important thing to 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 ask him is the importance of linking these two different uh, cultures in in Vancouver how 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 important is his job uh, or, or was his job and at that time when, when it was very complicated to bring the students and try to put them into a, an environment that was not theirs. And uh, I would like to, to tell us about that, uh, that idea of uh, having people from other cultures coming to Vancouver and integrating into, into Vancouver and sharing this, uh, their heritage with us. Well, the first thing I usually bring up when I'm, more often than not, I'm talking to uh, a group of uh, either Chinese immigrants or uh, Japanese immigrants or whatever. And so if it's a Chinese immigrant, I, <laughs> I will remind them that uh, uh, as Chinese, you have probably memorized uh, great number of things that Confucius said, the saint in China, right? And one of the most important things that he said was, uh, when you enter a different land, inquire about their customs, right? Mm -hmm. So that has been a guideline for uh, 2,500 years, you know, in Chinese culture, people have revered uh, the advice of Confucius, right? I remind them of that. There's also a folk equivalent. That's the, uh, the upper crust of society all knows that, right? And then at the lower level, the Chinese always say, Dao shen shan shang chang shen uh, uh, Learn to sing the songs of whatever mountain you climb. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> when you go to a different mountain, learn to sing the songs of that mountain. Yeah. Uh, so from the folk to the, uh, the, the creme de la creme uh, of society, you have, uh, first of all, that advice. Um, <clears throat> and then I, I get into a principle which I think is very, very important in, in a diverse uh, environment, in an environment that is characterized by diversity. So it's not just... Uh, Canada, Asia, uh, or Asian Canadians and Euro Canadians. It's in any situation at all that you find yourself in. Um, interacting, interacting in such a way that you will be able to relate 
to a, to a, a counterpart uh, who is con has been conditioned by a different culture. You don't have to abandon being yourself, but you do have an obligation if you want to succeed in in, in communicating effectively uh, to put yourself in the place of that person, right? To the, the, the Chinese have a saying, <laughs> uh, project yourself into another uh, environment, I guess, into another point, into another viewpoint. Uh, remind them of the importance of that, <clears throat> because if, uh, if you don't take that into account, uh, there's a good chance that you're gonna say something that might offend uh, the other person, and that's not a good way to start off a, 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 a new relationship. So, by putting yourself in the uh, in in the place of another, you're not abandoning what you really are. What you're doing is expanding what you can be, and there's so it's not an either or uh, situation that we're talking about when we talk about cross cultural or intercultural adaptation. Uh, we are talking about expanding your ability uh, to relate to a variety of, of, of self-concepts, a variety of uh, um, traditions, a variety of traditions. Yeah. So it's not either or, it is both and. Yeah, I think that, that is an excellent explanation of, uh, of the, the concept that we have now called uh, multiple identities, that you know, we all carry multiple identities. We don't have to be either or. Uh, mm. One can be, uh, one can, uh, one can mm. have, and those uh, all identities should be recognized and respected and, and uh, reinforced. Um, yeah, so um, talking about this diversity and which we have, and, and uh, uh, then uh, probably that'll be my last question, that um, we, we have here in, in Vancouver, which is uh, it's very uh, working very well. It's beautiful uh, that enriches our uh, cultural landscape uh, and, and enriches our society. Mm -hmm. um, so whenever there are like uh, diversity, there are very uh, there, there are quite a few chances that when we have issues, uh, there's always complexity and there's always uh, there could be conflicts and and, and and conformity of some sort. So considering all these uh, processes. So how do you see that the Asian, um, when we say Asian, in Asian is not necessarily limited to any specific country, but Asian as a continent, Asia as a continent. So Asian heritage here um, flourishing over the years and decades in, in the lower mainland. Uh, <clears throat> there is diversity, there's a, a, a great deal of diversity within the Euro-Canadian uh, sectors of society. Some of them uh, are people, you know, whose, uh, whose son I would not object to having my daughter marry to because they, you know, they have minds that can, that accept diversity as a source of energy, as a source of strength, if it is integrated properly. Mm -hmm. Um, diversity without a sense of unity is totally chaos. Unity without constituent diversity is stagnant. <laughs> everybody, everybody knows that all energy comes from difference, right? Without difference, there is no energy. With, if there is no difference, in sea level, then there is there is no you know water will not flow in such a way that you can uh, build a dam and create <laughs> electricity. Um, if there is no difference, I'm not sure I understand. Not sure you understand. Energy only comes from difference, mm -hmm. okay. but difference must be channeled in order to become useful energy. Society, the strength of our society comes in large part from its diversity, but we need to remind each other that we have to have a sense of commonality between us. And that sense of commonality 
is what unifies diversity, okay? And becomes a source of strength rather than a source of chaos. Difference without integration. And, and integration does not mean giving up your dif difference. It means being both and, both a, uh, you know, a, a, a chow mein eating, <laughs> loving Chinese and uh, meat and potatoes or whatever you want to yeah, you Multiple want to identities. <laughs> Apple pie or whatever uh, yeah. in Canada. Uh, you can be both. You don't have to abandon one in order to feel comfortable with the other, yeah. right? That's my main message. No. It's much, you, you'll be a much healthier person as a both and person rather than an either or. Excellent. Yes, uh, that is. I think that's the that's the message of Rams is trying to to mm. propagate as well or or, or spread around. Um, we got two questions. Uh, one from Gerald Joe and one from Vinny. Uh, uh, and Vinny, could you? Uh, I don't know. I uh, where can I find your question? You mentioned you put in Q and A. Could you could you just copy and paste here in the chat? Uh, so I'll start with Gerald's question. Uh, uh, I'm reading the question. Have you seen the seat at the table exhibits? Uh, at the Chinese Canadian Museum in Chinatown and Museum of Vancouver? No, I haven't. And the reason is uh, <laughs> I moved from Vancouver to, you know, from Carysdale, Dunbar uh, to South Surrey, White Rock uh, four or five years ago. Um, and I'm also you know, getting getting older, I've been retired. I don't, didn't get into town as much as I used to recently. And then for the past year now, <laughs> uh, not just since January, actually uh, last year in November, uh, my wife had a, a, a fall and fell from you know, the stairs coming downstairs and uh, had a compound fracture in her ankle. And so she was in the hospital and then in uh, the rehabilitation center and so forth, uh, well into this into this year, and then as soon as she was able to come home, uh, it was COVID, and we were advised to stay at home as much as possible. So we don't get out, and I haven't been able to get out. You know, to get in, uh, we get out once a week to buy groceries. Um, at, yeah. Fortunately, we have a supermarket. It's like a block and a half from here. So there's little, and they have a special seniors only hour from mm -hmm. seven seven a.m. to eight a.m. That's about all we get out for. Oh, okay. Um, so no, I haven't been able to get into town to. Yeah, especially these days. I've, it's been quite trying, I've been trying to keep up with it as much as I can through uh, my computer. <laughs> and, uh, I think that uh, I see that the table has uh, some virtual components that maybe the, the person, uh, uh, who's the person, uh, Gerald Joe can, can uh, uh, probably let us know about these components. And, and probably that would be very good for the public to, to see that exhibition, which is called I Sit at the Table. Okay, great, thank you. And I think uh, Vinny is there. Vinny, could, could you ask your question? Uh, 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 Jasper, if you can open her mic. Uh, yeah, Winnie, I think you should be able to speak now if you wish to unmute. Okay, that looks like, uh, oh, okay, okay, she's there. Hi, Jen, so good to see you. On hey, the Winnie. <laughs> By age, um, it's good to be seen yes. anywhere. Good to, good to hear but, you. I can't see you yet. <laughs> yeah, I don't want you to see me. I'm not so presentable. <laughs> I'm in the kitchen. <laughs> okay, okay. No, I got lots of uh, digital photographs of you, so <laughs> you can run, but you can't hide. Well, thank you so much for this very in-depth um, interview. Uh, we've, some of us have known you for a long time, but this is the most comprehensive way of kind of following your career as an interculturalist and specialist in this area mm. and a scholar and so on. My question is, have you ever used the Kwai Ban mm. to tell your own story or any longer form of stories that you might have written? <laughs> uh, no. Um, this is interesting. I've, I've, I've 
<clears throat> created several, some of which uh, you maybe you've attended, uh, in celebration of other people, like every used to be whenever either the Chinese Canadian Historical Society was going to honor somebody mm -hmm. uh, at their AGM or uh, it, it, you know I've celebrated a lot of people whom I've whom I've known since I came here in the Chinese Canadians and not just Chinese Chinese Canadians uh, uh, some of our First Nation <laughs> First mm -hmm. Nation uh, with uh, some Chinese heritage I've celebrated them I've celebrated them too in uh, Kwaiban, uh, but no, never, never, my, never myself. <laughs> May I humbly suggest mm. that you turn the camera on yourself, so to speak, mm. because um, there's nobody who can tell your own story better. Even mm. today, when you were talking about your growing up and speaking in different accents, I thought if you could give us a version on mm. your Kwai Ban. Uh, and, interesting. Yeah, that would be really authentic. And right. it's about time we have something that we will we will be able to play every <laughs> time we want to show people. Of course. Um, yeah, this version, this this folk art that you have taken onto the global stage. <laughs> so if we can have your story captured that way, that would be wonderful. I will send the camera team. <laughs> it's my special camera team just for you when you are okay. ready. <laughs> thank you, thank okay. you, Vinny. Uh, thank you. I think that makes a good project for you, uh, Jan. Uh, maybe uh, next project to work on. Uh, and so, so yeah. please do, do let us know when when you have if you get a chance to work on on, on this, and Vinny is okay. willing to uh, help you with that. My people will be in touch with your people, Vinny. Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, Jan. Uh, this one comment, uh, this is the last comment, uh, and then we have to close, uh, and that is from Phyllis Tang. She, she's empathizing with you for your wife's injury. Uh, that's, that's just a comment from her. Um, and uh, so thank you very much, uh, everybody. That brings us to the end of this event. I know we are running out of time, so uh, you know we, we could have continued. There's so much to, to learn from uh, Professor Walls. And uh, uh, again, thank you for being part of this first uh, event of uh, VANS Connections in 2021, uh, though virtually. And uh, now I will uh, request uh, VAMS, uh, connection, uh, VAMS President uh, Leticia Sanchez to say a few words uh, at the end. Thank you. I was going to say, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, but also we, we will be uh, hearing more about Jan uh, in um, in Asian Heritage, because he is going to present his book, which is going to be fabulous. Please come to that. It's going to be in April. I think we have it for April the 15th or 16th. And then he is going to participate also with, um, with Jimmy Yang uh, for the, the opera. And, um, and it has been just a, a pleasure to work with uh, Winnie and uh, Jan and Jimmy. To, to produce this event. Uh, thank you everybody for uh, attending the annual general meeting, for uh, keeping us in your hearts and, and, and we, we really hope that we can continue supporting you. Uh, thank you, Jan, for your always, always a fabulous uh, uh, insights. Uh, I want to tell you something. My daughter is watching and she says that uh, you have a new fan. You have a new fan. So my daughter says that, wow. <laughs> she says, wow, wow, wow. So thank you, thank you, Jan. I think that we have something else to say. And other than that, in, on my side, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Shahid. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Jasper. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so I, uh, before we just leave, I just want to, because you got us a comment, I think it's worth uh, sharing as a, uh, as a comment uh, from, uh, I couldn't see the name. So I just quickly read the comment. Just a comment that uh, all what Jan shared were so invaluable in our society, in such a uh, such such a diversity or diverse society. It could be challenging in communication and at times could cause miscommunication without fully understanding uh, where it's uh, coming from. Um, it's indeed so important to better understand the real messages behind the words uh, in communication, especially around the value and cross cultural. Uh, piece when it comes to in interpretation. Uh, thanks, Jan, for sharing. So that's the comment. 
So with that, we stop here. Again, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, thank you for your participation. Thank you, uh, Professor Walls, for being here. And I look forward to seeing everybody in our next uh, event um, um, of, of VAMS Connection. And have a great evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.